Hello, here we are again. We are going to wrap up chapter 13 today. So uh, after we are done with today, we will be, well, I'm actually going to assign a few in chapter 13, but we're going to wrap up the lecture in regards to chapter 13. Okay? So let's go ahead and go right to the homework. I don't think there was as much homework this time. Let's go ahead and look at exercise 13.5. And this was a matching one, right? Exercise 13.5. Now, some of these terms you had to kind of read in your book a little bit, too. We haven't talked about all these, but we'll talk about them a little bit now. Okay, match each description. Uh, we know how to do matching. Number one, holders of the stock are entitled to receive current and all past dividends before common stockholders receive any dividends. What is that? C, cumulative. C, cumulative, right? And most preferred stock is cumulative. Good. Number two, the issuing corporation can retire the stock by paying a pre-specified price. What is that? You had to read about that. Callable. That's callable. You can call in the stock. You can call it in. Okay. Callable. So number two is A, callable. Number three. Holders of the stock can receive dividends exceeding the stated rate under certain conditions. Now, this is rare, but what is this called? Participating. F, participating. Okay? Number four, holders of the stock are not entitled to receive dividends in excess of the stated rate. This is the usual case. What is this? non q non q This is... It's not non-cumulative. Non-participating. It's E, number four is E, non-participating. Okay? Number five, holders of this stock can exchange it for shares of common stock. That's one you had to read about. What's that? Convertible. Convertible, B, which is convertible. You can convert it into common stock. That'd be kind of a nice thing if it had that, and some preferred stock does. And then lastly, number six, holders of the stock lose any dividends that are not declared in the current year. This is, this is not the usual case, but it is D, non-cumulative. Okay? So, to summarize, there are the answers, okay? If you need to make sure that you got all those right, okay? Any questions on any of those? Not too bad, was it? Okay. Just kind of be familiar with those terms. All right. Um, let's go to the other one I assigned, which was exercise 1310, requirement 1A, 1B, and 1C. All right. Let's take a look at that. All right. Okay, let me go ahead and just put that up there. How's that sound? Always have to deal with this glare a little bit. Okay. All right. On October 10, the stockholders' equity of Sherman Systems appears as follows. I won't read those numbers to you. You can see those. Uh, number one, prepare journal entries to record the following transactions for Sherman Systems. And you can read the transactions that we need to do. They're on 1A, 1B, and 1C. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and do those. All right, let's go ahead and do those. All right, it first of all says we purchase 5,000 shares of, a, of its own common stock at $25 per share on October 11th, okay? So the journal entry there is we debit treasury stock for the number of shares we purchased, 5,000, times $25. I went ahead and wrote that cost up there so we can refer to it later. And then, of course, we credit cash. So we debit treasury stock, credit cash for $125,000, right? Now, what type of asset or what type of uh, account is treasury stock? It's not an asset, right? Treasury stock is not an asset. It is, you are correct, a contra equity has a debit balance since most equity has a credit balance. Contra means opposite or on the other side of. 
So contra equity has a debit balance account, and treasury stock is a debit balance. Okay? Cool. All right. 1B sold 1,000 treasury sales on November 1st for $31 cash per share. Okay, well, let's build the journal entry. We sold 1,000 shares at 31 each, so we debit cash for 31,000, correct? All right. Now we have to take that treasury stock off the books, correct? And we sold how many shares? 1,000? And our original cost when we bought it back up here was 25. So we reduce by crediting treasury stock for 1,000 times 25, which is $25,000. That doesn't balance, does it? Okay, so what do we credit? Additional paid in capital. Yeah, additional paid in capital treasury stock. Okay, and you know, they, they call it a little bit something different. Okay, they call it paid in capital treasury stock. I think I told you that these would have different names, some of them. Okay. All right, now I am going to go ahead because I know we're going to need it. Uh, paid in capital treasury stock. My writing is there's a little messy. That's paid in capital for the treasury stock. So I'm going to go ahead and post that 6,000 right here. You with me? Okay, so we'll come back to that in a second. All right, the next item says on 1C, we sold all remaining treasury sales shares on November, November 25th for $20 cash per share. We sold all remaining treasury shares on November 25th for $20 cash per share. Okay, well, how many shares is that? 4,000. 4,000. We had originally purchased 5,000. We sold 1,000 in B. So, now what we do is we debit cash we debit cash for 4000 times the $20 that we just sold it for is that correct is that right yep now we are going to let me build this entry we are going to credit treasury stock for 4,000 shares, 4,000 shares times the $25. Is that correct? And what is that amount? 100,000. 100,000. Okay. Can you see that? I think I can get that a little easier to read. Okay. Now, our first inclination might be to debit paid in capital treasury stock for 20,000 to make that journal entry balance. But we can't do that, can we? Because this cannot have a debit balance. It can have a zero balance, but it cannot have a debit balance. So what we're going to do is we are going to debit paid in capital treasury stock for 6,000, which is the most that we can debit it for. Okay? And I'll go ahead and write that 6,000 right here. Okay. Now this has a zero balance. Okay. Well, this journal entry doesn't balance. So what do I put the remaining 14,000 to? Retained earnings. Okay. Retained <coughs> earnings. Okay. I'll go ahead and show you there. Nice writing. Okay. All right. So. That is how we build that journal entry. Okay, Do you make sense? does that make sense? Any questions on that? Okay, I usually have a problem like that on the test, so. All right, that's it for the homework, huh? Okay, what we're gonna do now is go through a variety of smaller topics uh, to kind of close out chapter 13, okay? Um, so it's going to kind of seem like we're jumping around a little bit, but we're just covering, uh, you know, we're kind of concluding chapter 13 with these subjects. So let's go ahead and take a look at that first slide, which is on stock dividends, okay? What are stock dividends? Stock dividends are when the corporation distributes 
additional shares of its stock to its stockholders without receiving any payment in return. Okay? Well, why would they do something like this? Why would they give out more shares of stock without receiving any payment? Well, it's, we're going to see it can be used to keep the market price on the stock affordable. Okay? And I'll show you that in a minute. And it also, there's some that believe it can kind of provide evidence of management's confidence that the company is doing well. Okay? Now, I always give a little bit of a caveat with, it, with, it, with the second one. Um, if the company is clearly doing poorly, you cannot do these little accounting tricks and fool the market very easily. Okay? If you ever take a corporate finance class, you're going to learn that, about the efficiency of the, of the financial markets. Have you, ever, have you ever heard those terms? The market is very efficient. It's, very hard, it's, it's difficult to fool. Okay? So you can't just do a stock dividend and, oh, it must be doing great okay, if everything else says otherwise. So, but you know, some believe that it can provide evidence that management feels, feels like things are going well. But let's go back to the slide and concentrate on that first one. It can be used to keep the market price on the stock affordable. Let me give you an example. Okay? Let me give you an example that kind of might clarify that. Okay? All right, Daniel. Let's say that you have, you personally own 100 shares of stock, and let's say the market price out there, and of course the market price is not determined by us. The market, the market price is determined by the supply and demand curves, right? Okay. Let's say the market price out there is currently, oh, let's say it is $66 a share. Does that make sense? So you have 100 shares and the market price is $66 per share. So what is your total value or portfolio worth of your shares? $6,600. You with me? Well, let's say they offer a 10% stock dividend. Okay? That means they're going to give you, give every shareholder, 10% additional shares and they're not going to require any payment. Okay? So how many more shares are they going to give you, Daniel? 10 more shares, right? Yeah. Okay? So you had, you had 100 shares, they just gave you 10 more shares, 10% times 100. So now you have a total of 110 shares, correct? Now the market is smart. What is that market price going to move to? Lower. It is going to move to $60 per share. So now, Daniel, what is your total portfolio worth? $6,600. $6,600. It hasn't changed, has it? Okay. It hasn't changed. It was at 6,600 before, and it's still at 6,600. You just have more shares, but the market price adjusted. Does that make sense? In a way, you can think of it this way. The size of the pie has not changed. We're just cutting it into different size pieces. Does that make sense? So, a company might do this knowing that that market price is going to drop a bit and keep it in the affordable range for people. Make sense? Okay? All okay. right. Wouldn't you, wanna, wouldn't you not want that? Like as a stockholder, wouldn't you want your shares to be worth more? That is a great question. <clears throat> he asked, well, why would you want this? Wouldn't, the, uh, wouldn't you want the stock price to, to be going up? It's a great question. I'm going to answer it, but I'm going to talk about one more topic because it'll help clarify it. Okay? All right. Now, before I talk about that next topic, though, if you look in your book, you're going to see that there are, there are journal entries that you make in regards to stock dividends. When you do what we just did, there are journal entries that that uh, corporation has to make. Okay? I am not going to teach you those journal entries. Okay? I used to teach those. They're very complicated. They're very confusing to make. I mean, you can do it, but it's kind of complicated. 
And the reason I'm not going to teach those to you is because I, I have been in accounting for 25 plus years and I still do consulting. Do you know how many times I've made a journal entry for a stock dividend? Zero. Okay. I think the chances of anybody here ever making a stock dividend journal entry is extremely rare. If you do, call me up and you can be mad at me and we'll, we'll figure it out together. Okay. But I don't, if we had an infinite amount of time, I would, I would teach you that. But I'd rather concentrate on things that I think you're going to use and I think you're going to need in, in future classes. Make sense? So I want you to understand the concept of a stock dividend, but I'm not going to make you learn those journal entries. Okay. All right. Because you know what is a lot more, a lot more common than a stock dividend? Is a, does anybody know? Stock split. A stock split. Okay. So let's take a look at a stock split. A stock split is when additional, when a, a distribution of additional shares of stock to stockholders according to their percent ownership. Okay. Now, this is a very similar situation. Um, it's just uh, to a larger degree, okay? So let's, let's take a look at this. Uh, let's say somebody has a hundred shares of $10 par value stock, okay? A hundred shares of $10 par value stock, okay? Now that's not the market value. The market value is not up there anywhere. They have a hundred shares of $10 par value stock. Let's say the company decides to do what is called a two for one stock split. Well, what they're going to do is they're going to call in everybody's shares and they're going to give you two shares for every share they called in. Okay? So, Henry, if you had 300 shares, they're going to give you 600 of the new ones. Okay? Michael, if you had 400, they're going to call those in and they're going to give you 800 of the new shares. Make sense? Now, that's a two for one stock split. You can have three for one and even four for one, but let's talk about a two for one. Okay? In this case, it's a hundred shares of the ten dollar par value, that's the old stock. They call it in and they give two hundred shares of the new stock. Now I want you to note something. The par value actually changes, okay? The par value changes. The number of shares went to two hundred, but the par value of these shares and all shares actually gets halved in a two for one stock split. You with me? Now, there is no journal entries on stock splits. You do not make a journal entry. The only thing that you change is the description on the balance sheet as far as what the par value is and the number of shares outstanding and issued and all that sort of stuff. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, what do you think this does to the market price? You're exactly right. It's going to reduce it by half. So. Luke, let's say you had, you personally owned a hundred shares and let's say the market price was eighty dollars per share. That's the market price. So right now you have currently a portfolio of eight thousand dollars. Is that correct? Well they do for this two for one stock split. They call in these old shares. They give you two hundred new shares. The market is very smart. What is that market price going to drop to? Forty dollars per share. Okay. So now you have a portfolio worth what? Eight thousand. Eight thousand dollars. Okay. Now, this is exactly like the pie situation. Let's say this is the size of my pie that I have, and let's say I currently have it cut in four pieces, okay? A two for one stock split just says we're going to double the amount of pieces. The size of each piece is now half, okay? The size of the pie did not change, but now we have eight pieces and each piece is one half the size of the original pie slice. Does that make sense? This is like if you take ten dimes and turn them into twenty nickels, okay? Now, the market price went from $80 to $40, okay? Uh, let's, let's talk about that. 
This really makes sense when you think about it. Because take a company like Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola has been around for longer than your grandmother's been alive, okay? Over 100 years, Coca-Cola has been around. If you looked up Coca-Cola's stock price, their market price, in the Wall Street Journal, let's say it's $73. So you might step back and say, now wait a minute, you're telling me in 130 years of business, Coke's price has only gone up by, it, it, it's, it's 73, you see what I'm saying? That doesn't seem like it's risen very much. I mean, the most it could have risen by is $73 in 130 years or whatever? No. They have done many stock splits. They have done many stock splits. And that's why it's only that. If they would have never done a stock split, their stock price might be, you know, $32,000 a share. Okay? Now, if they did have a stock that sold for $32,000 a share, not many people could, um, could, uh, could purchase that. Is that correct? Okay? So you want to have people to be able to purchase your product. Okay? So as your stock prices go up, then that's when you're going to start splitting it as a company? Yes. And usually they like a trading range, you know, of, I don't know, $30 to $90 or something like that. So they, as your stock price goes up, they will split it accordingly to get it back in that range. When I owned PepsiCo stock, I can remember they did a three for one stock split. Okay? Does that make sense why you would do that? No journal entries for stock splits. Now, to your original question, Daniel, and it was a great question. You're like, well, won't the, won't the uh, uh, stockholders be bummed because their stock price just went from, well, what did it go from in the case that we were doing on the document camera? It went from $80 to $40. No, they're not bummed. They're fine because the market's very smart. Yes, the stock price dropped, and, um, but you had twice as many shares. Okay? Just like if you had two $50 bills and you took them to the bank and they gave you 10 $10 bills, you wouldn't be going, man, did I lose money? Because you didn't lose any money, right? You still have $100, okay? So the market's smart, okay? As a matter of fact, some people think that, once again, when stock splits occur, that's a sign that management thinks that the stock price is going to continue to rise. Again, you cannot fool the market too easily, but there is some theory behind that. Does this make sense? Okay. Some of this, I think, is kind of intuitive, all right? Okay. Um, now, I want to, again, I know we're kind of jumping around a little bit. I want to revisit the topic of the number of shares authorized, issued, and outstanding. Okay? So, let's do that with an example. Let's go back to the document camera, and I'll talk you through this. Let's say the number of shares authorized for a company is they have 100,000 shares authorized, okay? Well, what does that mean? Do you remember? They, have, they can give out that many shares. Yes, exactly. That's what the corporate charter gives them permission. You can, that's the number of shares that you can, if you'd like to, issue or sell. Okay? Now, let's say that they have their first issuance and they issue 60,000 shares. Okay? So now what you have for this company is you have what we call 100,000 shares authorized, 60,000 shares issued and outstanding. Okay? Now, issued mean, means that they have been sold to the public. Okay? That 60,000 of these sh shares have actually been, been printed up and sold to the public. Outstanding means, and they are still out there with the public, outside of the company. You following me so far? Now, with our knowledge of treasury stock, 
let's say that this company purchases back 20,000 shares of its own stock. So 20,000 shares of treasury stock they now have. Now I want you to understand that the situation with this company would be there's still 100,000 or there, there's still 100,000 shares authorized. There are still 60,000 shares that at one time have been issued. But this no longer applies. Now what you would have for this specific company is 40,000 shares outstanding because they are still out there with stockholders outside of the company. Does this make sense? So does that kind of clarify the difference between authorized, issued, and outstanding? Okay. Any questions on that? Anybody? Okay. All right. Checking these little topics off my list. Now let's talk about something called a stock option. What is a stock option? Now we are just going to really touch upon what stock options are. Okay. Uh, the most complicated class I ever took in my MBA at KU was on stock options and derivative financial instruments. And boy was it complicated. This can be a very complicated area. So we're just going to kind of hit the high points here. A stock option is the right to purchase common stock at a fixed price over a specified period of time. As the stock's price rises above that fixed option price, the value of the option increases. Okay? So maybe we, uh, maybe we give an option at a purchase price of $30 per share. Okay? All right, let's come off that. Um, let's go through an example. Jeremiah. Let's say you are hired on at my publicly held corporation. You are the new CFO. You with me? Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we might do is utilize stock options to incent you. Okay? Don't hear that word as a, as a verb much, but to provide incentives to you. Okay? So here's what we might do. Jeremiah is our new CFO. Okay? Let's go to the document camera. Okay. No, oh, I don't think I hit the right one. There we go. Okay, Jeremiah, you start as CFO, and let's say that our current market price is $26 per share. Are you with me? That's what our market price of our stock is right now. Okay. Well, what I do is I give you 100,000 stock options and with, with a stock option price of, we'll use the one that was an example, $30 per share. Okay. So I give you 100,000, think of it this way, I give you 100,000 coupons and each coupon enables you and gives you permission to buy a share of stock for $30 per share. Now do you understand that at this point that is worthless? That would be like if I gave you a coupon right now that you could buy a gallon of milk from Walmart for $7. Well, does milk cost $7 at Walmart? No. Our stock price is below what your coupon st states that you can purchase it at. So this is worthless right now. Okay? It's also probably worthless because in most stock option situations, I have given a like, you cannot even utilize these for five years, for at least five years. Because here's what this does, Jeremiah. This gives you the incentive as a CFO to make wise policies and to think long term for the company and to do things that will make this stock price over time go up. Let's say it's five years from now and the stock price is moved up to $75 per share. Are you with me? You see the beauty of this? What you can go do then is 
purchase 100,000 shares of stock at $30 per share. So what is that, $3 million, I believe? Okay, is that right? Check my math. I always get lost in my zeros. And you could immediately sell those 100,000 shares at that market price right then if you wanted to at $75 a share. That is 7.5 million, okay? And you've just made a tidy profit of $4.5 million. That's Jeremiah. He's very happy. He just made four and a half million dollars. Now, that seems like a bunch, but actually there's many times they give more stock options than that to new executives. But what this does is this, this encourages you to make good policy that's going to make that stock price go up. Now what happens if you do a crummy job and the stock price never goes above thirty dollars? What are those stock options going to be worth? Nothing. Okay? And that's how much bonus you should get if that happens. Nothing, right? Now, are the stockholders upset that we just paid, our, paid a bonus to Jeremiah of $4.5 million? No, they're thrilled because their stock went up. It almost tripled from 26 to 75. Does that make sense? Okay. So, going back to the computer. The, these are given to employees to help you focus on company performance in the long term, because again, there's usually a, t a period of time you can't even exercise these. Um, and the, and they're, they incent you to remain with the company, because if you decide to leave in three and a half years, your options become null and void. All right, make sense? Okay, next topic. Let's talk about the statement of retained earnings. We ever talked about retained earnings? Yes, it's like the capital account. Statement of retained earnings looks very similar to a statement of capital. You've got your beginning balance here. You've got your ending balance here. You added net income and the dividends declared, which is analogous to owner withdrawals. Those are subtracted, correct? Okay. So it's kind of a, it's a cumulative amount, right? This is a permanent account. We do not close retained earnings, just like we did not close capital. Okay? We closed two capital. We closed two retained earnings, but we do not close that account. Okay? Well, there's my slide again, just to remind us. Okay? What one can do is this balance, and I'll go back here, this balance of retained earnings is something that stockholders focus on because a lot of times because a lot of times the amount of dividends that will be paid is somewhat somewhat uh, hinged on the amount of retaining earnings that we have right some companies say you can only pay dividends up to a certain percentage of our retained earnings balance you with me okay now before we go on I need to state something this company has retained earnings of $950,600. That does not necessarily mean that they have cash right now of $950,600 that they could distribute. Okay? That retained earnings might be tied up in other things. Okay? So this is not a cash balance. This is a retained earnings balance. But what we might do is something called appropriated retained earnings. This is when a company's directors, they voluntarily appropriate some of those retained earnings because of a special need in the future, such as a purchase of a new um, facility or something like that. So what they actually do is the retained earnings statement looks like this. They don't just show retained earnings of 950, 600. What they say is, now wait a minute. 450,000 of retained earnings is appropriated. Maybe they're going to buy a huge piece of equipment that's going to cost a lot of money. And so they're kind of setting that retained earnings aside. Does that make sense? So that people will recognize, okay, we really only have unappropriated retained earnings of 500 
1,600. Does that make sense? So they're just kind of separating it, okay? Let me give an example, come off that real quick. This would be like, let's say that you are going to take your family on a cruise, all right? And let's say that the cruise is going to cost a total of $5,000, all right? You wrote a check and you sent it off to the cruise company and you know it's going to clear in three or four days, right? Well, let's say you currently have $5,900 in your checking account, okay? You have a lot in there because that $5,000 check is going to clear in a few days, right? Well, do you see, let's say you were married and your wife goes, we have $5,900? You might say, now time out. 5000 of that is for the check that's going to clear for the cruise vacation. So you really only have 900 You see how that, that 5000 is kind of appropriated? Okay, it's set aside because it's for a specific purpose. Go back to this statement. That's what they have done with this appropriated retained earnings. Is they kind of want to separate that out so that stockholders don't get too excited thinking that we have unappropriated retained earnings of nearly a million dollars when it's really only half a million. Now, uh, again though, remember that this is not a cash balance even though the example I used with the cruise seems to indicate that. Yeah? So it's appropriated like to buy a building in this example. Once they buy the building though, doesn't the money stay in retained earnings because it's a capital account anyway? Like what is, what's the point of showing it because it's still going to show up there eventually? Yes, and when they, when they make that purchase, and uh, especially if it's an expense, then retained earnings is going to eventually get adjusted and they're not going to have that unappropriated amount. But in this example, what they don't want to do is this. Look back at it. They don't want to pay out a ton of dividends, which is going to reduce retained earnings even more, because they have to have a specific retained earnings amount. Okay. Um, let me see if I can put some numbers to it off the top of my head. Um, you know, a lot of times companies will say in their charter, you can only pay 5% of, of retained earnings out. But they usually say 5% of unappropriated retained earnings. Okay? So this, this kind of gets the stockholders off your back a little bit. They don't think, why aren't you taking 5% times 950,000? Well, we just take it 5% times 500,000, okay? So it's kind of set aside and it's not. Again, it's not like it's cash moved out, okay? And as that is dealt with, they're not going to show an appropriated retained earnings anymore, okay? But this is mainly for the corporate charter's limit of dividend distribution according to the percentages it allows. So, so it's just to help them save money. Yeah, and like I said, for the, for, the, for the stockholders to truly realize, we really only have retained earnings that's unappropriate of 500000 okay. okay? Make sense? Not a huge deal, but, uh, you know, I want you to at least be aware of it. Now let's talk about a prior period adjustment. Um, okay, let's come off this for a second, because this is a question I have students ask me sometimes. They ask me, Dave, how did you get so brilliant? No, I'm kidding. That's not the question they ask. What they say is they say, Dave, we try to close the books. Remember closing the books? And like if you're closing the books at the end of 2014, you don't close them at 12.31.14 on that day and do all the work. You know, you wait till January of 15 and bills come in and you book them in the appropriate periods and all that. But at some point you say, 2014 and the transactions that are accounted for in 2014 is now over. You with me? Well, what happens if you issue financial statements and all of that for 2014, and then you discover an error? Okay? You discover a mistake that was made, and you've already issued the financial statements. What do you do? Well, first of all, if it's just a little error, an immaterial error, you don't do anything. It's not that big a deal, okay? What if it's a major error? What do you do? Like, let's say, and 
stay off the slide for a second, but let, we're, we're going to say that, let's say we had a $100,000 worth of equipment that was accidentally expensed. We should have capitalized it. We should have set it up as an asset, right? But we accidentally and mistakenly expensed it. Well, that's material. So what do you do? Because that pertains to 12, 2014. We've already issued those financial statements. Here's what you have to do. Take a look at the statement. You are going to show the retained earnings balance as it was previously reported. Now we now know that this is a mistaken amount. And I want you to understand that that is understated. That 875,000 is understated because we had a lot of expense that shouldn't have been an expense, right? Okay, so our expenses were overstated, thus our net income was understated, which we closed to retained earnings, and it is understated. So what you end up doing is you have to restate your financial statements, and you have to make a prior period adjustment. Now, we don't make it for $100,000. We make it for $72,000, which is net of the income tax. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, our expenses were overstated by uh, $100,000, right? But we didn't pay taxes. We, we, we really paid too few of taxes, didn't we? Okay. So the net effect was only $72,000 because of the tax effect. We paid less taxes. Okay? I don't really care that you understand the tax effects. This is not a tax class. But what I do want you to understand in looking at this slide is that we have to say this is the retained earnings that was previously reported and we now know it was a mistake. We are going to make a prior period adjustment for the cost of equipment that was incorrectly expensed. We're going we're gonna to figure out the net number with the income tax, but once we do that, our retained earnings should have been 947000 So that is now what we're saying our retained earnings is at 1231 of 14 as adjusted. Now keep in mind, this is on the statement of retained earnings in 2015. Okay? This is, on, this is on the statement of retained earnings in 2015. But what we're basically doing in the 2015 statement of retained earnings is saying, hey, remember that beginning balance of retained earnings that you thought was going to be $875,000? Uh, we goofed. It really should have been $947,000. So you wouldn't even make that until January of 16. Um, no, we, we discovered the error in 2015. And we made the adjustment in 2015. But so, so, but on this one it says that you're just adjusting it now, and that's 2015. So that, well, would, so that means technically they're showing that again on the 2015? Well, what they're going to do is they're going to probably make this entry on the first date of yeah. 2015. And thus, that beginning balance that they start with is really going to be 947000 after they do that. I got you. Okay? Mm -hmm. Again, I don't want you to get too hung up in this. I just want you to know that when you discover a material error for a prior period, what you do is you have to make a prior period adjustment on the statement of retained earnings. And let me tell you this. The market does not like that. You can come off the slide. The market does not look upon this favorably. Because what would you do as a stockholder that if I said, hey, Henry, you remember the annual report we gave you last year? Remember that? Um, it was wrong. But here's this year's, right? How are you going to feel about that? You're going to start to doubt, you know, the reliability of these things, right? Market prices usually do not react very favorably at all when you have to make a prior period adjustment and or restate uh, prior year financial statements. They don't like that. Okay? And understandably why. You wouldn't like it either. If you were given information, maybe you made decisions based on that, and now you're finding out it's incorrect. Hmm.
okay? Who's your, who's your corporate accountant? Who's your, who's your CFO? Maybe we should get rid of them, you know? Those, that's the sort of conversations that happen, okay? All right, lastly, let's take a look at, we have looked at the statement of uh, retained earnings. A lot of times what is found in, and this is usually in the notes to the financial statement, is there will be a more detailed breakdown of each component of uh, equity and how it changed for the year. Like here is retained earnings and how it changed through the year. Here's the common stock and the capital in excess of par and how it changed, okay? And ju this just gives you more information on stock sales, stock purchases and retirements, all that sort of stuff. Not a big deal. I'm not going to make you prepare one of these but I want you to know that it exists. If you ever look at an annual report, there's usually a more detailed breakdown of everything that happened in that uh, equity section, okay? Now, a couple of announcements. In the end of your packet, it says ratios to assess market prospects, and it gives you about four or five of them. For now, I don't want you to, you don't have to read those, you don't, don't worry about them at all, okay? Know that those pages are there, because at some point in the future, I am going to ask you to refer to those. You can come off the slide. But those slides on those uh, market prospect ratios, for now, just ignore them. It's not going to be on the test. There's not going to be any homework over them. Okay? Cool? All right. One announcement I want to make before I give you your homework, folks. And this is strictly for the people who are enrolled in my Accounting 2 online class. What I want you to do right now is, and do it right now, do it today. I want you to send me an email that says, hi, this is Dave Krug, or whatever your name is, and I have now completed the first seven lectures. I have now finished lecture 207, and I have watched and done the first seven lectures of, of Accounting 2 online. Now send that email to me today, because I like to keep track of how people are moving, okay? Every now and then somebody tries to send me an email and four weeks after and they go, oh, uh, I forgot to send you the email, but I watched 2007. I, I was done with it a month ago and I usually, I don't believe them. So send it to me right now that says, hey, here's who I am. I'm in your Accounting 2 online class and I have now watched the first seven lectures, okay? You don't want to procrastinate, okay? Online class, uh, you need to be uh, disciplined, okay? All right, let me give you your homework. If I can find where I wrote it down. Okay, what I want you to do is, let me find my notes. Switch it over. I want you to do quick study. 1311, exercise 1311, and I also want you to do the discussion questions. We don't do discussion questions a lot, but the discussion questions are on page 537, and I want you to do this discussion questions number 13 and discussion questions number 18. So quick study 1311, exercise 1311, and discussion questions 13 and 18 on page 537. All right, guys, we're going to start chapter 15 next time. So have those PowerPoints. Remember, the test is after chapter 15. It's going to be over chapters 12, 13, and 15. Start studying for that. Chapter 15 doesn't take that long, OK? And for you folks who are online, remember to always be checking that red calendar on the D2L website to see when your due dates are for Connect and for uh, test due dates. Okay? See ya.